She has written and or performed in the likes of Africa, Brazil, Paris, and here in the United States. The word warrior, Farallon Lady Dove, performance poet, author, and educator, joins me in just a moment on an all-new RXG Exclusives. We must open up our minds. Watching the award-winning RXG exclusive, hosted by award-winning actor and award-winning filmmaker Robert X. Golfin. I'm happy to welcome my cousin Lady Dove to the program. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Robert. Lady Dove is the featured poet on the CDs Khan Jamal, Return from Exile, and Tyrone Brown. Moon of the Falling Leaves. She's the author of Paradoxes, A Sacred Journey of an African-American Woman's Trials and Triumphs that pays homage to Black art and culture, and Color in Motion, a book of poetry with a foreword by legendary drummer Max Roach. She also wrote and starred in Little Girl Blue, a one-woman multimedia production about a woman's journey from victim to victor. In it, she played 17 characters, tour de force, for sure. So let's rewind a bit. You have a background in journalism. Did poetry or news writing come first? And did either help you with the other in any way in terms of the creative and technical process? That's a very good question, Robert. And um, I will have to say that poetry came first. Poetry was always a part of my life. I started, um, my mother started teaching me poetry and um, rhymes. And um, even my dad taught us a lot of nursery rhymes, but we were taught by my mother Bible verses and poems to recite in church at a very young age. So by the time, before I even started kindergarten, I was reciting poetry in church and Bible verses. And then as time progressed, Little no be notes to me, those little notes that I was scribbling around on pieces of paper or envelopes or napkins, I later realized that was poetry. So poetry definitely came first. And um, when I went to college, I wound up studying mass media arts, which is a heavy focus on journalism across mediums. So I came out of Hampton University back in the 70s. And our mass media arts program encompassed broadcasting, print journalism, uh, television and radio broadcasting, print journalism. We also covered marketing, public relations, even accounting. Um, but the emphasis was very heavily on writing. And I uh, wound up in a career uh, as a journalist, first in radio doing promotions and then uh, not quite journalism, but then in print, I actually wound up being a print journalist at the Philadelphia Tribune, Philadelphia Inquirer uh, for the most part, and then lots of other freelance opportunities. But I will say this, I learned over the years that my technical chops polishes my technical skills polishes my chops for my creative skills and my creative skills polishes my chops for my technical skills. Uh -huh. So as I got into different types of technical writing, grant writing, uh, proposal writing, um, journalistic writing, executive writing, copywriting, as I got into all the different forms of writing, I really learned how poetry played a part in helping that process. And like I said, vice versa. So that's one thing that um, I find is very relevant in my uh, practice. Now, for those who may be curious, can you explain the difference between poetry and spoken word? And also, how does one decide what makes poetry good or not so good? Is that a subjective thing? Okay, I'll take your second question first. It is subjective whether a poem is good or not good. It's, I think, totally subjective because I've had people read my poems 
and say that it felt like I was reading their diaries. And then I've had people experience my poems and say, I have no idea what you are talking about, like whatsoever. Hmm. So I've had it both ways. And um, I feel that I've been in the same boat where I've gone to read poetry and it's just like, I don't really get this. It's not moving me. And then other times I'm moved to tears. So that is um, is very true. And then you ask, what was the difference between spoken word and poetry? And that's another really good question. And Sonia Sanchez is a very um, prolific and um, legendary poet who lives in Philadelphia. And she has been over the decades, and I'm talking like the last five decades she's been in Philly, uh, She's been in the community teaching us poets and teaching people about the craft and sharing her craft. And one thing she taught me was not to call my poetry spoken word because there is a difference. Um, the poetry is can be spoken, but it's meant to be read. And in many cases, it may follow a format. So I might have a sonnet. I might have a villanelle. I might have a limerick. I might have free verse. There's just so a tanka, a haiku. There's just so many different forms of poetry that you can express yourself in. And I feel like with spoken word, it could be the same poems that you wrote, but there is a rhythm and a performance, performative, I guess you would call it, quality to it that is very different from the written word. Because the performance of the spoken word, the rhythms and the um, melodies and the complexities that were coming out of your vocal presentation, especially if you're a person like me that performs a lot with musicians, it becomes something different. And I don't say good or bad, I'm just saying different and distinct. So I literally consider myself a poet. And I do spoken word as well. Very important distinction there. And your mission is to create art that promotes the ideals of cultural preservation, global African liberation, and emotional healing. Can you break that down for the audience? Because you're not simply an artist. You're an artivist. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, okay, I grew up. I was born in the 50s, came of age during the 60s and the 70s. I graduated from high school and college during the 70s. And so I was very much influenced by the civil rights era, the black arts movement, and all of the laws and situations that have been such big headliners uh, around the globe, particularly as it pertains to the oppression of black people throughout the diaspora, but particularly the legacy of slavery that we have here in the United States. So my quest, even as a young girl, was always to fight for our liberation. And however, whatever that looks like. For me, that looks like writing poetry, performing on stage, taking photographs, making paintings. It has a lot of different looks to it. And I want to live my life and practice my art in a way that is intentional, intentional in terms of getting us closer to liberation, trying to be a part of the solution to what is going on on so many fronts. So in that regard, I feel it is, is a duty and actually a privilege to be on the front lines in this way. Uh, there's a quote by Nina Simone, and she says that an artist must reflect the times. And there's another quote by an African um, liberation fighter by the name of Ken Sarawia. And he said, art is not just for art's sake. Art must do something. So when I think of those two particular artists, Nina Simone and Ken Sarawia, I really have to say this is my job as an artist, is to instigate and to observe and to report back. 
So that's the that's where I get the black liberation. In terms of cultural preservation, I find that some of the genres that I'm working in are like live theater arts, live uh, music and multimedia productions, so-called jazz. Jazz is a word that's been given to that art form that Africans um, in America created um, however many years ago. But um, just the preservation of our cultural ethos and the elevation and perpetuation of the grandeur and beauty of Black culture and the diversity of it. And that's like my little piece of the world that I'm using myself as an example of just one person who is in love with our culture and blessed by our culture and wanting the culture and the positive aspects of it and the infinite creativity of our culture and the endless, boundless, um, prolific expression of our culture that keeps changing every minute of the day, it seems. I um, always want to be a person that's going to be on the um, front line of the front line of perpetuating that and of encouraging that and teaching it to young people and to old people or middle-aged people, whatever their ages may be, people getting their consciousness raised through learning about our culture. That's beautiful. And then the third thing you mentioned was emotion, emotional healing. Thank you. You mentioned emotional healing. And I do a lot of nature photography, Robert. I do a lot of artwork that reaches back to our ancestors and our family. I do a lot of family tributes. You know that. Um, I feel that there's an emotional response that we want to create to help us heal and to move us away from victimhood. So when I'm talking about emotional healing, I'm talking about using the arts, either consuming them or expressing them yourself to heal and to be made feel whole and to experience beauty and pathos and to learn. So if I do take a picture of a rose when you look at that rose, you don't have to think of, of black power and raised fists. You could think of the beauty of that rose and how it's part of nature. And we're connected to that nature as humanity. And wow, can I stop here in the middle of my day, whatever I'm doing, and just appreciate this rose? That's the emotional healing that I'm seeking, not only for myself, but for people who are going to see that photograph and experience that beauty as well as I do. Well, as a fellow writer and one who dabbles here and there in the poetry world, I know that inspiration comes from everywhere and my process is different project to project. Where do you gain the highest inspiration? How do your concepts typically go from thought to execution? And you mentioned Sonia Sanchez and your parents. Who are some of your earliest influences? Okay, I would have to say both my parents, Esther and Samuel Dove. And my grandmother on my mother's side, her name was Julia Dingle Lemon. And so she's also a cousin of yours. Um, I would say my family and my aunt Rhoda and my two older brothers, Sammy and Alonzo Dove, because in our family, family was just everything. And it's still pretty much that way, even though, of course, I'm a person of the world and I've traveled the world and, and, um, still exploring the world. But I also feel very much influenced outside of my family. And as I got older, of course, Sonia Sanchez, Maya Angelou, James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, Nikki Giovanni. There are a lot of Black writers and poets who have very directly, the last poets, Gil Scott Heron, who have very directly influenced me as a person just growing up and gaining my own footing and my own understanding of the world. And then I would say so many jazz musicians, Max Roach, Tyrone Brown, Odin Pope, Khan Jamal, Warren Ori, just to name a few, uh, been very profoundly blessed to have been around. Trudy Pitts is another musician. And also I would say Kendra Butler Waters is a very young um, musician who has had a profound impact on me. I don't even think she's, 
I don't know. She's just a young woman who is extremely wise beyond her years. And she is an amazing talent. And I just get inspiration whenever I experience her work. Well, in addition to your writing and poetry, you have expanded your range in the last several years. As you mentioned, uh, photography, painting, mixed media. What brought about that new direction for you? Well, I have to say that I had always been writing. I mean, I explained to you that I started writing at a very young age. Uh, I was taught how to write my name when I was about, oh my goodness, I was in preschool when my brother taught me how to write my name, my oldest brother, who's three years older. But you can imagine if he was, say, four or five, and I might have been two, and he's coming home from school and he's showing the other children everything that he learned. So that's one of the ways we learned. Sammy was one of our greatest teachers. And you can see he has an outgoing post personality even to this day. So you can imagine even as a child, he was like that, just more energy <laughs> and all oh. over the place. <laughs> so that was pretty natural. But then with the artwork, I was so insecure about my art. And I didn't realize that the collages I was making in my bedroom were art. And then I studied photography with my dad. He was a great camera buff. I studied photography at Germantown High School. And I also took some photography classes at Hampton University. And as a young woman, I was really into photography. And then when I had my daughter and carrying the baby and all her stuff and then the camera equipment, I was like, it's too much. So I just started carrying the baby and all with a notebook and a pen. And I would just jot things down, jot poetry, jot notes, things like that. And, and that trajectory into my journalism career came really directly after when my daughter was about a year old is when I actually became a professional journalist. So I stayed in that writing mode and into the, the creative and the technical writing for many, many years. And then in, I want to say the mid, like around 2008 or 2010 or 2015, those years when digital cameras became very um, prevalent. And I wound up with a digital camera and then later I wound up with an iPhone. And I started noticing myself taking a lot of pictures. I took a trip uh, to cover a story, actually, to write about Richard Wright. I went to Paris and I was there. I had a little Canon um, digital camera. And when I got back home, I bought myself a Nikon digital SLR. So that's sort of taking trips. And then I'd been to the West Coast and I'd been to Arizona and I'd been to Florida and different places. And I started capturing very beautiful tropical blooms, especially the bird of paradise. I started seeking out the bird of paradise whenever I was in a warm or tropical client climate. But it just sort of morphed into uh, being invited to exhibit my photographs and then expanding the photographs into the multimedia paintings and the collages that I used to do even as a teenager, not, as I said, not realizing it was art. I just was putting stuff on my wall. So now it's very intentional and it's, um, I'm spirit led with all of it. I, I can't really say why the creator chose to imbue me with these gifts and why did the creator choose to reveal these gifts to myself and to the world at this stage in my life. It's just following the creative source, following the creative spirit, being obedient and just always being in awe of just life and the gift of life and how much gratitude there is to be shared amongst humanity. So I just feel very, very much intuitively led, spiritually led, and my inspiration, I, I would say, comes from the higher power because I don't even know how I come up with these things because I feel as though I'm just being obedient and just channeling what's coming through me. So it could be an observation of something, of an interaction of perfect strangers in a street scene, or I could just be in a profound state of thought 
right here in my room and just ideas just flow. So I never know. Yeah. Well, you speak of emotional healing and so many people are in pain, especially women and young people and those who seem like they have it all together, whether they're a celebrity or someone non-famous behind closed doors, sometimes it's a completely different story. How do you find solace amid adversity? And what words can you offer those who feel that all hope is lost? How do you find solace amid adversity? I think just in honor of my lineage, I've gotten in the habit of surviving. It's just being uh, a child of God and a person on the trajectory of my whole family and all the ancestors that went and sacrificed before me. So the idea is that no matter how hard it gets, never give up. Never give up. That's the first thing. You you have your survival. It's like your pride. <laughs> you're never going to give up. And you don't want to. And if you're feeling very terrible about your current situation because listening to people and observing what's going on, a lot of people right now are in a lot of pain and they're going through um, Robert. And people are going through some really tough situations and it's hard to even hold your head up. And it's hard to even imagine how you're going to go on because stuff is just so intense and so not what you may have planned and so not what you're trying to experience. And it's just like, oh, you mean I got to deal with this mess? But I think that as hard as it gets, train your mind think about a solution. Stop wallowing and stop woe is me and stop going over this crisis over and over and over and over. Don't do that. Fixing your mind. I'm going to be solutions oriented. God, give me a solution. Uh, you know, Allah, whoever you pray to, Jehovah, whoever you pray to, spirit, uh, inspiration, great universe, whoever it is you pray to, ask for the strength and the wisdom to seek gratitude. So if you can be grateful that you are alive, if you can be grateful that your breath is working, if you can, if you have your eyesight, if you can be grateful for that, if you're ambulatory, if you can be grateful for that, if you're freaking breathing, if you can be grateful for that. And once you start to just count and list and train your mind on, I'm grateful for this conversation I'm having today. I'm grateful that I have a roof over my head. I'm grateful that I have food to eat. I'm grateful that I have family. And if you don't have any of those things, are you? what are you grateful for? Are you grateful for your breath? Are you grateful for your mind working so you can train your mind on solutions. And I think it should be known that out of the greatest adversities comes some of the greatest triumphs, the greatest accomplishments. And we hear this all the time of the great people who've come before us. Um, I love reading biographies and autobiographies. And um, one of the books I read last year, but I'm still going over it, all the time here and there is a book by Quincy Jones called 12 Notes. And he literally breaks it down how in his own life, his greatness came out of his greatest diversity. And it's just an amazing story. I would recommend anyone reading 12 Notes by Quincy Jones because it gave me a lot of insight into the creative process, but it gave me the insight into greatness and how he was born with such under uh, such terrible circumstances and how he's risen above it his whole life. So if Quincy Jones can go what through what he went through, my goodness, I can at least, you know, smile because I saw a butterfly or a sparrow or something, you know, or you know, a beautiful child walking down the street or something like that. So yeah. And I assume that you are an empath 
of sorts. And do you carry that same mindset into carrying other people's burdens on your shoulder? Or do you not even look at it from that perspective? Well, I don't, I don't know that I look at it from that perspective. I look at it when I'm on stage or if I'm sharing artwork, I, I do want people to have, get a healing sense from it and, or understanding because it might be consciousness raising, but I, I want to share and emote in a way that's going to be useful and beautiful. And of course, if, entertaining if that's what if that's what we're going after um when it comes to people's energy people are attracted to me robert and they do feel comfortable opening up to me and i listen very attentively when i'm single-minded i try to be in the moment but i recycle that energy i don't hold on to it i try to recycle that energy into something positive even if the only thing I can do is listen quietly, and especially if I'm not being asked for an opinion, then I don't want to um, try to fix anything. I, I'm just there to listen. Sometimes I'll be in a situation where I feel like my perspective can help. So I'll offer it if I feel it's appropriate. But most of the time, I feel it's not appropriate. People don't necessarily want your advice, uh, but they do want to emote. And it's not my job to hold on to their energy. It's my job to recycle that into something that's going to be positive within my energy force. Because I think sometimes people who, uh, how can I put this? I'm just a person that wants to recycle any negative energy into something higher, more positive and turn it into something that's, positive. I keep using that word, but solutions oriented. I don't want, I don't care how horrible it is. And I know we stop to pay our respects and we're all in some stage of grief because of the lives that we're living. I mean, we're living in this world where we're all, I don't care if you're young, middle age, old, and somewhere in between. So many people are crossing over into the other realm that we're all affected by death notices. And so we're all in some form of grief for a friend or a family or a neighbor or something going on in a community that's sad. So I don't want to walk around holding on to that. I want to take whatever beauty I can from that and disperse that out into the atmosphere and to that person who's suffering. I don't want to understand what they're going through because it's not right for me to try to understand them because nobody can really understand what they're going through because that's their particular situation. So brushing it off by saying, I understand. No, I don't understand. I empathize and I hold a space of peace for you. And I, that's what I you know, hold for you. And I hold gratitude for myself and for you as well. But sometimes people, when they're in an acute stage of crisis, emotional or grief or financial or whatever, it's so hard to hear from other voices. So you want to just encourage that person. Well, Lady Dove, what is coming up next and how can people support your art? Okay, thanks for asking. I have... Several projects that are coming to fruition, which I'll be announcing soon. Um, but the best way to keep in touch with me is really I have a blog on my website. So my website is feralindove.com, or you can also go on doveculture.com. And there are links to all of my uh, events, and there are also links to my blog, as well as all of my social media. So the best way to keep up with me is follow me on my blog and subscribe to that. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. You can always check me out in those places. And um, yeah, I do have some projects that are in the final stages of production and I'll be announcing them as it gets closer towards the end of this year, which is 2023. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much for your time and perspective. This was powerful. And 
uh, I invite you to take us out with some of your original work as we end this episode of RXG Exclusives, Farallon Lady Dove. Robert, thank you so much. It's been so wonderful talking to you. Thank you for your really thoughtful questions. And um, I would be honored to recite some poetry for us today. And I decided to stay with my theme of solutions. And this poem was written last year, 2022, when I was thinking about solutions for problems. And this is called Words Can Heal. Words can heal. Words can bring about peace. Words can bring about prosperity. Words can predict the future. Words can make you laugh. Words can make you smile. Words can make you blissful. Words can bless a person. Words can bless a family. Words can bless a dwelling. Words can bless a community. Words can heal. Words can automatically summon all five senses. Sight, sound, touch, taste, smell. Words can increase our intellect and enlighten our worldview. Words can heal. Words can touch our hearts, extinguish our angst, heal our pain. Words can heal. Like the smell of grandma's sweet potato pies baking in the oven. Words can heal. Like the self-esteem you never knew you needed until you heard Nikki Giovanni's poem, Ego Trippin', and all of a sudden felt whole for the very first time in your entire life. Words can heal. Like the gospel Maya Angelou preached in her landmark poem, And Still I Rise. Words can stimulate thought patterns and reinforce positive habits that are aligned with the highest of human virtues. Great job. You got this. Way to go. Stay encouraged. Thank you for your service. Words can endear us to each other. Sunny, Snooky, Rev, Doc, Teeny, Tiny, Doll, Doll, Baby, Baby, Doll, Chucky, Sweet Cake, Sweetie Pie, Cookie, Cat, Queenie, Dee Dee, Spank, and Boots. Words can heal. Words can give you grace. Words can grant you permission to extol your talents, gifts, skills, and ability. Words can heal. Your words are your superpowers. Words of praise can ignite the spark that catapults the next genius into the stratosphere. Words can heal. Words can bond us to each other. Bubba, Boo Boo, Honey Pie, Sweet Pea, Punchy, Lovey, Auntie, Baba Poo, Grandpa, and Bibi. Words can express love for each other. Pop Pop, My Mom, Nana, Mama, Sis, Baby, Babe, Cuz, Birdie, Goosey, Ducky, Junior, Trey, Precious, Peaches, Pumpkin. Words can heal. Words can heal. Words can heal. I am sorry. I apologize. I forgive. I understand. You have my deepest sympathy. Take all the time you need. I am here for you. I love you. Words can heal. Wow. All I can say after that is powerful and thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Make sure to like, comment, and hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so you never miss out. RXG Exclusives, hosted by Robert X. Golfin, now playing.